we did a lot of uh, round uh, roundabout talking last time, but we did actually get down some technical things and pointed out that 80 to 90 percent of the heat in a arc is carried by the electrons. I mentioned that an arc was an electrically augmented flame, and basically the way you get around the boundary layer problem of these cool gases at the interface is you shoot electrons across them. But in order to get those electrons across there, it turns out that's a cooler region where you don't have ions um, because the ions condense at 3,000 degrees. You got to be up around 10,000 degrees, and I showed you the phase diagram for argon. You got to be around 10,000 degrees before you start getting significant amount of electrons separated from the uh, the atoms to make ions and electrons. And so this cool region around the electrodes, the anode and the cathode, is only around 3,000 degrees or 4,000 degrees. In fact, it's it's not it's it's the non-isothermal boundary layer. It's actually got a range of temperatures between about three and 10,000 degrees. And so you don't have enough electrons left over uh, to carry the current. So the electrons actually have to punch through that boundary layer. But because they're small, they're very mobile, they can. But in order to punch through, you have to have a relatively high voltage. And so I drew a, a plot showing the anode voltage fall, the plasma column voltage, which is a much less steep gradient, and then the, uh, the steep gradient at the cathode. Uh, actually, the current goes, current goes that way. The, the electrons go the other way. Um, so there is, and we're going to come back to that in just a little bit, uh, that anode voltage uh, drops as far as that goes. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about plasmas and the properties of plasmas right now. And you have copies of these plots. There's two plots here. Um, if you, let's start with the lower plot. This is the temperature of the gas versus the pressure in millimeters of mercury. So one atmosphere is way over here. So this is the one atmosphere plasma. It turns out a welding arc is called a high pressure plasma by the physicist. And the reason they call it a high pressure plasma is because they say that the ions and the electrons and the neutral atoms uh, are all in thermal equilibrium. And they actually call it LTE, local thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay. If you read plasma physics and literature, people will always be talking about LTE, local thermodynamic equilibrium. And the physicists love to debate whether there really is local thermodynamic equilibrium in the plasma, whether all the particles in the plasma are at the same temperature or not. Well, on this particular plot, um, you can't quite see it. It says T minus, which is the electrons, the temperature of the electron, the, ne the, the negative particles, is, and that's actually not equal, that's actually approximately equal. It's a straight line with a little wavy line above. Is equal, is approximately equal to the T of the ions, is equal to approximately equal to T of the gas, the neutral atom. So if we're talking argon, that's an argon atom, that's an argon ion, positively charged, and that's electron, electrons. And so it, at pressures above about a tenth of an atmosphere or a third of an atmosphere and above, with the physicists call it a high pressure arc because everything's roughly at the same temperature. Um, and, well, let's just leave it at that for a second. And that temperature is on the order of, well, they show up to 10 to the fifth here, but it's actually around 10, 10 to the fourth, a couple 20,000 degrees, 30,000 degrees Kelvin, as far as that goes. Uh, and it really doesn't matter whether you're at 10 atmospheres. We'll talk uh, uh, in 3371 about underwater welding. You really can't, you can't have a stable arc in general above about 30 atmospheres pressure. Uh, and the reason for, for some of these things is you're in a high pressure arc because the inner, the inner particle spacing between the uh, particles and the gas is dense enough that their mean free path is such as they will thermalize and bounce into each other uh, in a very short distance. They're close enough together. And you actually compress them by 30 atmospheres and you start getting to the point everything's so dense that you start getting funny flow, you get funny turbulence in your plasma in the flow field and the arc becomes unstable. Um, anybody, just to talk about underwater welding for a second, anybody know what uh, 30 atmospheres, which is 450 PSI, what that, what depth that would correspond to in seawater? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It turns out uh, for seawater, it's 0.44 uh, pounds per foot, PSI per foot, uh, as you go down. So if you're down 10 feet, it's 4.4 um, uh, psi uh, pressure. If you, so, isn't this about right? No divers here. Anyway, it's about a thousand feet. So you said you said 30. 30 times 30 is about a thousand. So it's about a thousand feet. And so you can do underwater welding uh, down to about a thousand feet with electric arc, with with arcs. Um, you can't go much higher because the arcs become unstable. Now, what happens is I go to lower and lower pressures. Well, what types of things do I have at lower and lower pressures? Well, I have fluorescent lights. Fluorescent lights are just electric arcs. Uh, in a fluorescent light, they use less, less energy because if you put your hand on them, they're cold, right? They're not hot. An incandescent light is wasting a lot of energy and just developing heat in the room. A fluorescent doesn't. Well, what happens is when you get down to, and I don't know exactly what the pressure is in a fluorescent arc, but it's probably somewhere down here in the uh, one millimeter of mercury range or a tenth of a millimeter of mercury, somewhere down in this range, what happens is the temperature of the electrons is up here. And the temperature of the ions and the neutrals are down here. Anybody guess why you have the splitting of the temperature? I mean, it's all particles. You no longer have thermo local thermodynamic equilibrium because you got two orders of magnitude difference between the temperature of the electrons and the temperatures of temperature of the ions and the, and the neutrals. You're in an electric field in that arc, in that uh, in that fluorescent tube. And what do you have if you have a charged particle in an electric field? The electrons get accelerated. They have a very low mass, so they get accelerated very quickly. Or they get they they their rate of energy pickup is faster than the ions. And in fact, the neutrals don't pick up anything in the electric field. So it turns out the electric field is accelerating preferentially the electrons in one direction and the ions in the other direction, but the ions have one one hundredth of mobility, and so they are slow. And they bump into, they're also large, and they bump into the gas, the neutral gas atoms, and they, those two thermalize with each other. The electrons, on the other hand, can kind of come zipping past. The electron mean free path is much greater than the ion or the gas mean free path, and they get accelerated to very high velocities. It turns out velocity of the particle in the gas is proportional to the temperature if you go through the kinetic theory of gases. So if you get very rapid electrons, they have effectively a very high temperature. And, they, and when they do get slowed down, they, get, they radiate electricity or electromagnetic energy, right? And that's light. So the electrons are generating the light. The gases and the ions are at a relatively low temperature. That's why you can hold on to this thing. And it doesn't get warm. Or it's not too hot to touch. So you have a two temperature plasma. Now, when you get down here and you get to very low pressures, this is 10 to the minus 2 millimeters of mercury, about 10 to the minus 5 atmospheres, you now find that you're getting a big enough mean free path that those ions can actually get moving and actually go some distance and pick up some energy before they run into a, ga a neutral gas atom. And so now you get a three temperature plasma. You get a further splitting. Okay? So it's basically just how these things are being accelerated. But, um, okay, so that's a little bit on low pressure arcs, transition region, and high pressure arcs. The rest of the lights down here, welding arcs up here. If you take another approach to it, you can t look at the welding current versus the voltage of the arc. And it turns out the high pressure arcs, which are going to be running between 10 and 1,000 amps that we're going to use for welding, have very, very low voltages. They're down around 10 to 30 volts uh, for, across the arc. Anybody have an idea what the voltage is in the fluorescent light? It's not 110, I'll tell you that. You have a ballast, and a ballast is nothing more than a transformer. And that, you actually either have a ballast or you have a high frequency, basically like a Tesla coil. Okay, that's the cheaper ones that are always flickering on you. 
uh, the ballast just start fires. So, I mean, you have your choice. You can either burn down the building with a ballast, but it takes about 10 or 15 years before the transformer goes bad and starts the fire. Actually, often they just result in an open, but sometimes they short out and start fires. Um, but, uh, the, or you can have these little, basically it's just a little Tesla coil type of thing that generates a high frequency and a high voltage. But you have a several thousand volts in that arc of that fluorescent light, okay, uh, in order to, to make it operate. So I have several thousand volts, and I have currents that are down in the milliamp regime uh, at several thousand volts in the actual arc. And so you get um, here, uh, well, here's the milliamps. You get what's called a glow discharge, and that's the fluorescent light. Um, this is the transition from uh, what they call an ab abnormal glow, and then you have a dark discharge, from very, very low currents. It turns out if you strike an arc um, uh, in, a, in a vacuum, or not, yeah, if you strike an arc in a vacuum and have a very fast oscilloscope, as the current rises, you can actually trace this, I've been told, you can trace this whole curve, okay, uh, whoever cares. But in fact, there's differences between vacuum arcs, low pressure arcs at low currents, and high pressure arcs, uh, so far as that goes. So there's uh, a huge field uh, of arc physics. In fact, uh, uh, there was a, the, the head of General Electric's research lab um, was uh, a former person who uh, was a professor at Harvard in the 30s, a uh, guy named Richard Cobine was head of GE Research Lab at some time. Anyway, he, he studied a lot about arcs in the 30s and 40s and 50s. There was also a famous person from MIT who studied a lot about arcs. Anybody know who it was at MIT? Professor of Physics, later president of MIT? No, uh, actually Doc, Doc did some arcs. I knew Doc Edgerton, but uh, um, it was actually Carl Taylor Compton in the 1930s. He had I can't remember where he came from, Princeton or somewhere. Anyway, he had, he was he was basically an arc physicist um, who became president of MIT, and so Building 26 are the Compton Labs, and 26100 is actually Compton Hall or something like that. Um, in any case, um, there was a lot of study of arcs. What? No. What? What? In the top pocket? Oh, I don't know. Um, there was a lot of study. Oh, here? Oh. Oh. Well, okay. Uh, I got to move my pants. This is a problem with metals, right? Um, in any case, where was I? I was talking about uh, arcs and stuff. The reason arcs were important is because as people were using more and more electricity, they had to develop circuit breakers to break the arc. And when you have a big utility, these are not small circuit breakers, when you, when you break the circuit, when you turn off the switch or, or open the switch, there's a lot of inductance in the system. And the inductance in the system is basically a stored magnetic field, which once, when it collapses, as you try to drop the current, it tries to resist it, and it basically, by Lenz's law, basically, the, the collapsing magnetic field keeps the current going. And so when you actually open these things, and you've got, you know, 10,000 volts, or actually, what is it, 13,200 is the standard, vol one of the standard voltages in uh, distribution systems, and 1,000 amps, and a huge inductance in the system, and you open this thing up, you can get a very big arc. And it can melt things very, very quickly. And you can just end up with a puddle, melt things together. Instead of opening the circuit, you close, you know, the circuit stays closed, and you burn down things other places. So there was a lot of interest in, uh, in developing vacuum arc circuit breakers. And so in the, in the 40s and the 50s, after some of this basic work in the 30s on arcs, they did develop, uh, General Electric and a few other companies did develop good vacuum arc circuit breakers to, trying to extinguish arcs these great big arcs, um, so far as that goes. Sure, how about that? Okay. Um, anyway, so getting back to, um, to the good old arcs. So that's a little bit of plasma physics. Let's now talk about how the heat is actually transferred to the workpiece. And you've got a paper 
by Metcalf and Quigley that takes you through all this stuff. Uh, but the, the heat to the the heat to the anode and remember the anode in this case, one person pointed out it's different than fuel cells and batteries. Um, if this is the cathode and this is the anode, this is called the cathode because the physicist said that the electron beams they were studying in these arcs in the 1890s emitted a, a ray which were called cathode rays. And the rays coming from there were basically the electrons which are going from the negative cathode to the positive anode. So the electron flow is in that direction. Now, it turns out that the heat, Q, to the anode is equal to the heat of the electrons plus the heat of convection plus the heat of conduction plus the heat of radiation. Uh, and that can be rewritten as, oops, can't be rewritten as Q, as the current times three voltages. The work function voltage, the anode voltage drop, and the Thompson voltage. Now, this is the work function. That's the anode voltage drop. And this is the thermal energy of the electrons. Okay. Oops, I'm sorry. This is actually this. This is actually just this term. So I got Q conduction plus Q convection plus Q radiation still. Well, let's look at these. I told you before that 80 to 90 percent of the heat is carried by the electrons. So this term is 80 to 90 percent of the total. Radi radiative heat from the arc. Anybody have an idea of the other 10 percent or so of the heat? How much is radiation? Nope, less than 1 percent. Told you, I always ask you the trick question. Right? Um, it's about a half percent. And these can be four or five percent. Okay? Now, what do I mean by conduction and convection? Well, remember we had the gas boundary layer? We still have a gas boundary layer. I still have a hot gas at 10,000 degrees up here and a cold uh, surface at 1600 centigrade down here if I'm melting steel. And so I have this boundary layer where the gas temperature is something on the order of 3,000 Kelvin. And I have to conduct the heat from 10,000 across there. And there will be some conduction and convec convective heat flow, which will be about 10% of the total. It turns out the radiative heat flux, actually, you were right about the 2% radiation. It turns out there's about 2% um, radiated to the surface, but there's 1.5% radiated away. By the, by the hot surface. And the reason the hot surface, which is much colder than the hot gas, radiates more is because the hot surface is a Planck radiator. It's a condensed phase. And it's radiating at all wavelengths, whereas the plasma is only radiated at a few spectral wavelengths. So in one case, if you want to look at, get into a little more detail on radiation, the Planck curve this is wavelength and this is intensity, the Planck curve is going to look something like that. Um, at shorter wavelengths, you have something here. But anyway, this is the peak Planck. The, so this is a solid. Pardon? Do you need some? We gotta get another.
Those guys in the World Trade Center talk lost the clip. That's the problem. Okay, so this is a condensed phase that radiates at all wavelengths. And a gas is going to radiate very intensely at a few wavelengths. So your eyes see the very intense radiation from the arc at a few wavelengths, because it is very intense at a few wavelengths. But the actual radiative power underneath the Planck curve can be equal or even, or it can be almost equal to the total integrated power under these peaks. Okay? Uh, so your eyes see lots of light from the arc. But it turns out you're going to get a sunburn just as bad from the hot well pool as you will from the arc, uh, so far as that goes. Um, so that's where this stuff comes from. And that's the same 10% heat or 1,000 watts per square centimeter as you got if this was just a hot flame. Remember I said an arc is just an electrically augmented flame. I have the velocity of the hot gases coming against here in the hot boundary condition. And that's this. And this is the radiation, which is a little more intense in an arc because I'm dealing with a little bit higher temperatures. But 90% of the heat is over here. And that 90% of the heat is carried by the current, those electrons. Now, where, how are they carrying the heat? They're carrying it in these three other terms, the current times these other things that are voltages. And to understand that, and I may actually have a, see if I have a graph of this. I do have a graph of some of this. But you have it in your notes, too. What is the work function? If I just think of an electron in free space, sitting stationary in free space, in physics we often define that as the zero energy level. Remember, in thermodynamics, there is no absolute value of energy in the world. You can only talk about energy differences. You have to have a reference point. And the typical reference point for energy of electrons is a, an, an electron sitting in a vacuum stationary, a free electron in space, but without a lot of kinetic energy. So if that's the zero point of energy, is this electron just sitting there stationary, in order to, to um, get that electron out of a solid, why is the electron in the solid unless it has a lower energy? It has a lower energy down here at what we call the Fermi energy. Okay? If I look at an energy diagram, this line up here is the zero of energy in free space. The electron, the electrons in the in the solid or the condensed phase, the solid or the liquid, are up, fill up the energy bands of around the atoms in the condensed phase up to the Fermi energy. The highest energy of the electron in the solid or the liquid is at the Fermi energy level. The difference between the Fermi energy and the free electron is called the work function phi. I mean, that, you can't quite see it here very well, but that's a, that's a phi. Okay? So, if I want to look at the we don't need this one anymore. We'll use that one again later. Um, so this is phi. In order to get an electron out of the cathode, I actually have to add phi energy to it to get it into the gas phase or the plasma phase. When I now put it back into the solid, I'm going to recover the work function of this solid down here as the electrons flow back in. They're going to go to a lower energy state than they were up here. So if I consider an electron here, it's going to have three energy. It, to get from here down into here, there's three energy components. So there's the thermal energy, because it's hot. And that means it's not just resting at zero. It's actually moving around. And that's the Thompson energy. And the Thompson energy is equal to 3 kT over E. Uh, not my notes. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's. The Thompson voltage is basically, if I remember correctly, 3 kT over the electronic charge. And so, yeah, or 3 halves. 3 halves, right? Single particle. 3 halves R is the heat capacity. K is 
K is R for atoms. Okay, the gas K times Avogadro's number is equal to the uh, gas constant R. So three halves KT is just the heat capacity at that, uh, or three halves K is the heat capacity. T, and you have to divide by energy to make the voltage, to make this a voltage rather than an energy. Okay, so three halves KT is the thermal energy of the electrons at that temperature T. You divide by E to take electron volts energy to volts. So three halves KT over E is the Thompson energy. So that's the thermal energy the electrons have. I now have to punch them through this anode voltage drop. Remember, there's a four or five volt drop here. So this is four to five volts. If I remember, the Thompson energy is two to three volts. No, it's not. What is it? We can figure it out. It's too hot. Uh, it's not quite that high. Uh, it's one to two volts, I think. But anyway, actually, does anybody know how to calculate it? There's a couple of rules of thumb. If you know that uh, 25 millivolts is equal to 300 Kelvin. If you're an electri electrical engineer, you know that all the time because there's equations they have to go through when they start dealing with some of the uh, physics of the thermal energy. You're looking for thermal noise in a circuit or something. And it turns out 300, millivol uh, 300 Kelvin is equal to 25 millivolts or 1 40th of a volt is equal to room temperature. Uh, so if, if I'm at 10,000 degrees uh, divided by 300 Kelvin, that's 30, right? So 30 times a 40th is 1.2 volts. OK, so 10,000 degrees Kelvin is about 1.2 volts. So the Thompson energy is something on the order of a volt. You could have 20,000 volts in an arc, or 20,000 Kelvin in an arc, something on the order of 1 to 2 volts. OK? The anode voltage drop is 4 to 5 volts. It turns out the work function can be anywhere up to 7 to 8 volts. Uh, if you put all this together, I've got um, 7, 12, 13 volts. There's my 13 volt arc, roughly. I mean, you know, I can have a, if I have a shorter arc, it can be a 10 volt arc or something, but something on the order of 13 volts, and that times the current is going to be equal to the heat that's going in by the electrons. And that will typically work out to 80 to 90 percent of the total heat going to the surface. Now, because I just, there's an asymmetry here between the anode and the cathode, this was all worked out for electrons going this direction. If the electrons are coming out of here, there's actually, this is a heating effect as the electrons go into the anode. As the electrons come out of the cathode, there's actually a cooling effect. You have to put energy into the electrons to boil them off, if you will. There's the heat of vaporization. You can talk about the heat of vaporization of the electrons. You can also talk about the heat of condensation of the electrons as they go into the, this material. So you're boiling them off of here and you're condensing them over here, if you want to think of them in terms of evaporation condensation. And that's what this equation is all about. This is basically the heat of vaporization or heat of condensation. I'm cooling here and I'm heating here. It turns out, if you measure all these things, this is not the same geometry as that, but typically the cathode gets about, of the total heat in the arc, about 70% goes to the anode, and about 30% goes to the cathode, roughly. Of this heat going to the anode, of that 70%, 80 to 90%, or over 60% of the total heat in the arc, is carried by the electrons. And the rest is the con conduction and stuff. Some of this 30% is not just the electron cooling, it's the heating of the plasma by conduction and convection. Okay, But there's about twice as much heat generated at the anode than it has at the cathode. And how do we know that's true? Well, we know that's true. In gas tungsten arc welding, I typically use the electrode as negative. Can anybody think of a reason why I would want to do that? I don't want to melt that electrode. 
if I don't want to melt the electrode, I'm going to put it in the position where it develops less heat from the plasma, right? It turns out if I take an eighth inch tungsten electrode and run it with the electrode negative, I can probably run that at 100 or 150 amps. If I switch the polarity around, which I sometimes do for reasons we'll talk about later, um, it turns out I can only run that at maybe 60 to 80 amps before the tungsten melts. So you can prove that there is an asymmetry to the heating in a DC arc by just trying the arc. And you will melt, when the electrode is positive, you will melt at a much lower current, half the current, as you will get when you are running electrode negative. Now, the American Welding Society officially calls this DC electrode negative <coughs> for an arc as opposed to DC electrode positive. But what you'll more often see in industry is they'll call this straight polarity and this reverse polarity. And don't ask me how they got straight and reverse. But that's just a historical thing. But for instance, link electric has different types of welding electrodes, and some of them are NS, meaning you use them with straight polarity, and some of them are NR, meaning you use them with reverse polarity. Okay. Um, and the difference is in those electrodes is behavior because in one case you're emitting electrodes from here, electrons from here, which is the electrode they're selling, in the other case you're emitting the electrons from here. It's hard actually to pull those electrons out of that solid. Cathode emission is something, if you want to study it, there are, for the last 80 years, there are about 20 different theories of how electrons actually get out of solids and get into the atmosphere. Okay, and it's not understood. Um, quantum mechanics is not, it's one of the areas where quantum mechanics has failed to uh, help us understand what's going on. Because quantum mechanics has a hard time dealing with the type of voltage gradients that I can have here. We'll talk about it later, but typical types of voltage gradients that I can get to, to get this emission are 10 to the 8 volts per centimeter. I mean, that's a lot, that's 100 million volts per centimeter right there in a very thin layer in order to pull those electrons out of that solid. But the important thing to remember about all of this, the one key point, remember a lot of this stuff is details that you don't have to remember. The key point is there's an asymmetry to the heat flow. You get more heat at the anode than the cathode and 90% of the heat's carried by the electrons. Okay, so using those t two simple principles, we can start talking about a lot of things that happen in welding, or why we weld the way we do. There are a number of different welding processes. One is gas tungsten arc welding, which is often called TIG, where you use a tungsten electrode, W is Wolfram for tungsten, right? And that's going to be negative. This will be DC electrode negative, or straight. And this process was invented in the United States in the 1940s in order to weld aluminum with arcs. And in fact, um, it was the Navy in Philadelphia that had some of the first gas tungsten arc welding machines, and it's because the Navy used to build aluminum aircraft in Philadelphia. Um, you know, we didn't have an Air Force back then. Um, there's also gas metal arc welding, where I have a metal electrode, which if I'm welding steel, it's a steel electrode, or if I'm welding aluminum, it's aluminum, or titanium, or nickel. It's made up of something of a substantially similar composition to the base metal I'm gonna to try to weld. In this case, typically my joint prep might be some sort of groove geometry, and drops are gonna come off, and they're gonna fill up in here. So this will be typically, most typically run as DC electrode positive or reverse. Now, here I'm trying to melt the base material. I'm not trying to melt this. Why would I want to have this type of polarity? Well, it just kind of makes sense. I'm trying to melt this, and I'm not trying to melt this, so I'm going to choose the orientation of voltage that's going to make this melt and not that, 
if only 30% of the heat's up here and 70% is down here, obviously I want this to be the negative electrode and this one to be the positive electrode. Now, there's another reason for it. Uh, uh, actually, that's the primary reason. Let's not worry about the other reason. The, that's the primary reason. In this case, I want to melt this electrode, so I actually want the electrons going in and have my extra heat right here because it's how fast I fill up the drops. All I care about here is having enough heat down here that I melt the edges enough that I get fusion. Okay? I get a little thin layer melted here, and then I want to fill this up with drops as quickly as I can to make that weld. So it sort of makes sense that gas metal arc is going to be electrode positive because I want to put the heat on the electrode, not as much on the base plate. Over here, I want to do the opposite because here I'm just trying to heat the base plate. Now, it turns out some materials, like let's say this was copper. Copper has a very high thermal conductivity and will suck the heat away from this very, very rapidly. So Hitachi developed a, uh, their own in-house welding power supplies a number of years ago uh, because they end up welding a lot of copper for great big bus bars and, and great big electrical equipment. They built a special AC welding machine where they could change the duty cycle between the AC and the DC, or the uh, electrode positive and electrode negative. They wanted electrode positive to melt the copper off, but they wanted the base plate positive in order to get enough fusion. And so they had an unbalanced square wave power supply. Where the um, base plate being uh, po being uh, positive was a shorter duty fraction than than the um, this would be the base plate and this would be well okay so um, this would be heating the electrode and this would be heating the base plate on this part of the cycle this is a zero voltage right now I don't know if they ever commercialized it they use that as a competitive advantage for themselves but it just sort of makes sense if you you can't run just a straight um, electrode positive or electrode negative copper, in one case you don't melt the electrode enough, in the other case you don't melt the base metal enough. You can run, what most people do is they just run AC and they try to average it. Hitachi has an extra dial on there so they can balance the heat the way they want. Okay? Between the two. And that actually would be a very useful power supply if they would commercialize it. But they're not commercializing it, they just use it internally. Now, another thing. No, they publish papers on it. Anyone else can build it if they want. It's just, uh, there's, you know, probably a million dollars worth of development to go and design a power supply like that. It's not a simple, simple thing. If you just try to go through a regular old transformer rectifier system with an unbalanced system like this, the, the transformer is going to see a net offset of the average between the two. And that net offset essentially just heats the transformers. I mean, I'm not an electrical engineer, but if you look at these things, balanced AC means that you're not generating a lot of heat from the magnetic material of your transformer, okay, for a balanced AC. You have an unbalanced AC, and you start running into problems of your essentially storing magnetic field and doing eddy currents that are doing internal heating and wasting thermal energy in the transformer. In fact, that's a problem because when I weld aluminum with gas tungsten art, if my aluminum, which has a very stable aluminum oxide skin, if I don't, if I just try to weld over the aluminum without cleaning off that aluminum oxide skin very far with this polarity, I'll get a terrible looking weld. Anyone who's ever tried to weld aluminum can be very frustrating because you try to do everything, but it's basically because of the aluminum oxide skin that's on there. However, if you use AC with aluminum, it turns out that uh, uh, you can uh, clean off, if you change the polarity, the reverse polarity, you can clean off that aluminum oxide skin. Now there's a theory out there that it's because you generate, if this becomes negative, <coughs> this becomes positive, there's argon ions up here. This is what the welding handbook will tell you. There's argon ions up here 
and the argon ions hit the surface and break off the aluminum oxide. That's the theory for the last 50 years. If you look skeptical, you're right because it's garbage. That's not what happens. Somehow there's something, it has something to do with oxygen up here. And the only way I know that is because uh, a 13A student, Dan Reese, who just retired this summer as commander of Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard uh, and retired from the Navy, in his thesis uh, back in the early 80s, basically showed that that you did not get the cleaning action in aluminum if you got rid of all the oxygen in the system. You get a little bit of oxygen in the system somehow to do this surface cleaning action. There's something in the plasma, but it has to do with oxygen and not the argon. And what the physics are, I don't know right now. Uh, because he graduated it, I never had anyone else to look at it. However, an interesting thing is when you then go, so people actually will often use AC to weld aluminum because you have a, a good melting cycle when this is negative polarity, and you have a good cleaning cycle of that surface oxide when this is positive. However, it turns out the current between the two is not balanced, and so you end up getting an unbalanced uh, situation here, and a, a good gas to start welding machine will have an AC balance control so that you don't overheat your transformer so that you essentially try to balance out the positive and negative cycles. It's not like the Hitachi system where you can intentionally introduce this and the power supply is designed to take care of it. The, and the welding power supply is designed to take care of it, but to bring you back to balance, not allowing you to choose any balance you want. Okay. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, you know, we got time for that. Uh, the next one is when you look at all this and you say that 80 to 90 percent of the heat is coming from the electrodes, or from the electrons, that's true, that analysis is done for argon, which is a typical shielding gas, because there's lots of argon in the world. Where do we get the argon in the world? The air. Someone said air? You're right. How much argon in the air? Um, 1%. 1%. Roughly 1% of the air is argon. So there's lots of argon. Not a problem. Well, could you use nitrogen? Um, you can use nitrogen, but not on steels, because in steels it creates Swiss cheese. You get porosity in the steel. You could potentially use nitrogen uh, on some other things, on other other metals, but argon is relatively cheap. Um, but you can't use nitrogen on steels. Okay. Um, and that's probably the main reason. Um, uh, there, there may be some other. Anyway, I'd like to start thinking about it. Let's just look at argon. And we say argon, I've got electron heat. We know is 90% of the heat. And the um, conduction, convection, radiation heat ends up being a net of about 10% of the heat. Now what happens if I use helium as a shielding gas? Helium, where, where's the helium in the world come from? 99 point something percent of the helium reserves in the world come from the natural gas wells in the United States. The United States has pretty much a monopoly on helium. There are natural gas wells in Arizona that have up to 6% helium in them. There are some in Louisiana that are typically half a percent or something like that, in Oklahoma and other places. Don't ask me why, but most of the helium is stored in the natural gas in the southern, southwestern United States. In that case, how do other countries run their nuclear reactors? They, they pay $20 a liter for their liquid helium, whereas we pay about $2 a liter. The world price of helium is 10 times the U.S. price. Okay? Because we have it and they don't. And in fact, the only way for them to get it, if they want to, instead of buying it from us, which they do, is essentially to condense it from the air where it's like 0.05 or 0.05%. It's a very small percentage. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Their cost to do that is about 20 bucks a liter for liquid helium. Our price is about two bucks a liter because we, you know, we got a tremendous concentration. The problem is when we burn off all that natural gas, the helium's gone, it's back in the atmosphere, and entropy is taken over, it's gonna cost us 20 bucks a liter. 
There was a big study by the Natural Academy of Sciences a few years ago because Congress originally, about 50 years ago, had the strategic helium reserve, and they guaranteed a price for helium, which made it profitable for the natural gas people to strip the helium off rather than just shipping it to the pipeline and having you burn it in your home. You don't actually burn it, but it goes up the stack. <coughs> about 10 or 15 years ago, Congress dropped that, and there was a big study. And the study is, we haven't destroyed the helium in the world. We just made it more expensive for people in the future. And so if you actually run the economics, it does make economic sense now just to, to basically flare it. Um, because the cost today, you can afford to pay 10, 10 bucks more, or you know, pay 10 times as much 50 years from now. Because we have like a 50 or 100 year supply or something, I can't remember what it is. But, you know, a dollar today, or a dollar 20 years from now is only worth a nickel. I'm sorry, yeah, it's only worth a nickel today. You're only willing to pay a nickel today for something at 8% interest for something that will be worth a dollar 20 years from now. That's why we only go out and, and uh, look for oil 20 years ahead. We, only do, we don't do anything more than 20 years ahead because economically, if you do the compound rate of interest, actually I can't remember if that's 8% or 20%, okay? It's either, I can't remember which hurdle rate I used, but uh, you got it? Uh, it's I think um, a dollar twenty years at eight percent discount rate is uh, twenty one cents today. Oh, uh, twenty one. Okay, we we'll do it at twenty percent discount rate. All right, and it should be about a nickel. So then we're down to two and a half cents. Oh, two and a half. Okay. <laughs> anyway, something on that. Right. But I mean, the point is, a dollar twenty years from now is not worth very much today. Anywhere between two and a half cents and twenty cents, depending on whether you use an eight or twenty percent discount rate. Okay. And so you just can't afford to store helium for more than 20 years. Um, there's actually so much natural gas that I suspect they just shut down some of those wells because they got plenty of other. However, it turns out we know that helium significant, melts significantly more effectively the base material in gas tungsten arc than argon does. And the typical answer in the welding handbook is because argon has an ionization voltage of 4 point, 14 point five volts and helium is 24.5 volts and they say oh you have a higher ionization potential you have a higher voltage in your arc and therefore this is a hotter arc very nice theory it's been in the welding handbook still in the latest edition that just came out a month ago I'm pretty sure certainly in the one that came out six six years ago it's wrong you know it's wrong when you measure the temperature of the two arcs and they have the same temperature. Why? Because they're not helium arcs, pure helium arcs, and they're not pure argon arcs. They're metal vapor arcs. You only need 5 to 30% of your arc to be ionized. Well, you can get that, you get that much metal vapor in the arc. So the temperature arc is actually controlled by the metal vapor in the welding arc. If you, act, if you go and measure these things, and you actually make an argon-helium mixture, which we often weld with, You'll find the argon, if you'll see argon ions, you won't see any helium ions. So if helium doesn't even get ionized, who cares what the ionization voltage is? There is actually about a 100 degree Kelvin difference between a, a helium arc, welding arc and an argon arc. 100 degrees Kelvin, big deal out of 10,000. That doesn't explain it. What explains it is the gas boundary layer and the fact that helium has three times the thermal conductivity of argon. How do I know it's three times? Because the kinetic theory of gases says that the thermal conductivity of the gas is proportional to one over the mass. Let me just call it mass. You know, I'll call it mass of gas. One uh, square root of one over the, the inverse mass of the gas. Well, what's argon? Argon's got a mass of atomic weight of 40. Helium's got an atomic weight of four. 40 over four is 10. Square root of 10 is three. Helium has three times the thermal conductivity of argon. I just proved it to you, right? To an order of magnitude. Actually, better than an order of magnitude. So, if the conduction and convection heat transfer across an argon arc will give me 10% of my heat, I'm going to get three times as much in helium, right? Proportionately. I still get 90% of my heat from the electrons, because nothing's changed in the electrons in the, in the physics of how the electrons enter the, the workpiece, but I'm gonna get three times as much 
So in fact, this equals 120%. If I work, if I'm working with a 100 amp argon arc, and I call that 100% of my heat, I'll get 20% more heat if I switch my gas to helium. In the United States, I can afford to do that for welding. Very few parts of the rest of the world use helium as a welding gas. They can't afford to at 20 bucks a liter in the liquid. The United States can right now. Whether we can 50 years from now is another question. But 50 years from now, we're all dead. No, we're not all dead, but I am. <laughs> uh, I'm older. No, I'm not older. But we're going to talk some more tomorrow about the rest of the world quite often uses argon hydrogen as a shielding gas. And you'll see that you can get the same 20% increase. You say, well, 20% increase, how big a deal is that? Turns out in gas tanks and arc welding, it's maybe only, and there's debates in the literature, whether it's 20 to 50% efficient. If I am only 50% efficient, that 20% increase in heat actually ends up being a 40% increase in productivity because it's 20% on top of the 50%, which means 70% transferred to the workpiece rather than 50%. If it's 20% on top of 20%, it can be 100% improvement, right? So it depends and, and stuff, but just the point is, Helium gives you significantly better heat transfer. It has nothing to do with ionization potentials, which the welding handbook and everybody else in the world says. I did actually publish this at a welding conference about 15 years ago, but no one was no one bothered to read these papers. Um, and actually, I talked to some other people, and actually, some people are starting to figure this out. Uh, but in any case, it is the thermal conductivity of the gas that's important, and we'll talk about why you get a similar thermal conductivity.